This is the podcast helping to create, provide, and expand winners in life. Positively life-changing experiences through music for all. Go for it! This is the podcast that encourages everyone to... Break breaks! Welcome to Break Ranks, the official podcast of the Bands of America Marching Band Championships. I'm Dan Potter, one of the stadium announcers and a media personality for Bands of America and Music for All. This week, turning music into pictures. It's about listening to that process, seeing the journey, just kind of feeling what is the music trying to say to you. With visual designer and judge Kim Kuhn. So the field is a big stage. From writing drill. It's musically full. You want to make sure your stage is just as full. To individual choreography. You're going to feel awkward. Let's just see where this goes. It's time to focus on the visual side of marching band. It's time to break ranks. Bands of America held two regional championships this past weekend as we gear up for the start of Super Regional season this weekend in Indianapolis. Let's check last weekend's results. And in first place, John Pollard gets us started in Prosper, Texas, north of Dallas. With a score of 88.75, 88.75. The 2023 Bands of America North Texas Regional Champion from Frisco, Texas, the Wakeland High School Marching Band. After finishing fifth at the BOA Dallas-Fort Worth Mid-Cities Regional last week, Wakeland High School of Frisco, Texas improves over three and a half points in a week to take gold at Prosper, sweeping all three captions on their way to the title. Prosper High School was second in their home stadium and Timber Creek High School of Fort Worth was third. The class champs in Prosper are all from Texas. L.D. Bell took the 4A medallions, Wakeland 3A, Lovejoy High was tops in 2A, and Whitesboro, always a strong small Texas band program, was the 1A champ. The other regional this past weekend was in Conway, South Carolina at beautiful Coastal Carolina University. Brad Bell on the mic. With a score of 86.15, 86.15, the 2023 Bands of America Carolina Regional Champions, the Wando High School Marching Band from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Bobby Lambert's team at the Bands of Wando producing another regional champion this year, taking all captions to win in Conway. South Carolina's Catawba Ridge High School was second. Nation Ford High School, another South Carolina school, was third. There were no Class A schools at Conway. Catawba Ridge was the 2A class champion. Nation Ford tops in 3A, and Wando took home the 4A medallions. When I watch a marching band show, my attention goes first to the drill and the drum majors, because that's what I did. And I think many of us who used to march do the same thing. Yeah, we soak in the whole show, but... We tend to zero in on the parts of the production that we have the most experience or expertise in, which is why I'm so excited to chat this week with Kim Kuhn. Kim is a visual designer, a drill writer, a guard instructor for bands and winter guards. She's also a visual judge for Bands of America, Drum Corps International, and Winter Guard International. She tells me one of the keys to her success in the activity was having a good mentor. I was blessed to have a great mentor um, as my first, the first, first person I worked with, um, Jason McIntosh was the first person I worked with here in Michigan. And I was with him for a few years and he taught me a lot, a lot as, when it comes to design and, um, the, just the, the whole visual package. And so I got to learn and be a sponge for a good number of years from some great teachers. And right now you are designing, judging, what are you doing? Yeah, I design a uh, color guard, um, work with some marching bands doing color guard design and the overall kind of package. Uh, I work with some groups in the winter as well and write winter guard shows. And I judge for the Bands of America, for Drum Corps International, and for WGI as a visual judge. So you and I are going to talk viz here because yeah. that's my background. I was, awesome. before they called it a visual tech, I was a M and M instructor. I was a marching and maneuvering instructor way back in the day. And and that kind of points to the evolution of the visual side of this activity. It has its roots in military marching, right? Things that you can still see in the military that you can still see, say, from the Texas A&M band. Uh, that's, that's the roots of, of what we do visually, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the marching bands have been uh, come from the military origins. They, the songs they used to sit, they used to play would direct the troops on these long journeys and maintain that morale and get the troops on the battlefield. 
And you still see that, like you're saying, in today's presentations, even just in the design of some of the uniforms. And some of the, the marching bands even have ranks, um, you know, which I guess the break ranks title yes, exactly. <laughs> named the podcast. Um, and you, so, and then in the like the late seventies, early eighties, uh, designers like Steve Brubecker, George Zangali, you started to see design these uh, elements where you started to see those uh, the fronts start to become arcs. Arcs then started rotating and passing through each other. Rotation started happening. And it went from being very, um, very symmetrical in, in drill design to more of an asymmetrical um, elements. You know, you didn't have that uh, balance of what was going on side one, side two being exactly the same. It started breaking away from the 50, line, 50 yard line a bit more. Um, so those, and I think the changes in rules over time have allowed for more artistical freedom in the overall presentations. And you see definitely the influence from, from WGI in color guard and for percussion, percussion specifically, for example, being more integrated in the overall design package. Yeah. Um, when you say symmetrical drill, what usually was a part of that symmetrical drill was a drumline battery that just simply came up the 50 and went back down the 50 to the back of the field, and then came to the front again when they needed to be heard, and then went to the back again. Right. So they, the drumline straddled the 50, and there was uh, identical stuff going on side one and side two. That's what symmetric, symmetrical drill was. I remember literally in 1979, one of the I was marching with the Geneseo Knights, and I remember one of our visual instructors saying to another one, yeah, the judges are telling us we need to put more curvilinears in our drill. I mean, that was literally the point in time when they said, yeah, let's bend these lines a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool just to have seen, like, if you watch some of those older shows and see now with multiple elements even going on in the field and how they work with one another, it's it's been a, a fast a fast process and evolution yeah. for sure. Absolutely. I, and I look at drill. I, I think I decided about 15, 20 years ago watching drill. I could not clean it anymore. I don't, I would not know what I was doing out there on the field trying to clean what has become just mind boggling, complicated drill. How much time, Kim, do you, does the average competitive band spend on visual during rehearsal as opposed to music? I think it depends on the group. Um, some groups have marching band as a class. So they do the music part of their program a lot in class, and then they're able to work on, so they work on music during the day. And then after school, the, the rehearsals are geared more toward the overall visual production. Um, so that's, you know, I guess it depends on the, the, the group itself. Another factor is just the time of season. Some groups divide their time differently between music and visual based on where they are in the season. Some may focus more heavily on um, just the basic elements of visual, the visual part, early season, and then later they're putting more the music and the visual together, more late season. So it all depends on the group and how they divide their times. I, um, when I taught, as far as you know, marching, that was one thing, and then every once in a while we would throw in some sort of other visual flair, like a horn move, uh, maybe a move with the hand, something. Nothing approaching what's referred to now as choreo or body movement. Right. That that element alone has to take up almost as much rehearsal time as the drill, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think if you start out by teaching those fundamentals early season um, and teaching the very basics, um, you know, you see a lot of plies, lunges, uh, forced arches. You can take those three elements have a sound understanding of those early season and kind of plug and chug throughout mm -hmm. the, the show as needed. Um, so it's, if you do that properly at the beginning of the season, it's easier to and get that training solidified. It's easier to do that and just kind of throw them in later as you need to add more uh, depth to the production. Are those kind of movements, those body movements, are they written real time by, you know, a choreography instructor or is there a catalog of movements that, you know, like you said, you can plug and chug? Or is it a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. Um, it, it, it all, because you see bands of every level. You see some bands that 
um, stay very vertical with the body and just do some lower body shaping here and there. And then you see some bands that completely have uh, like an over their, their whole body changes into a character and they're just morphing and moving through space and through time. So I think it, it all depends on, like I said, the background of the person teaching them and the background of the kids, what they know, what they're able to do and what they're, what they're able to allow themselves to be comfortable with. How do you get a kid comfortable? I mean, band kids sometimes are awkward. <laughs> I know because I was one. So how do you, how do you get an awkward 15, 16 year old to move like that, Kim? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, with, with my kids, I tell them like, you're going to feel awkward. We do a lot of role play. We do a lot of um, improv where I said, you're going to feel awkward. Let's just see where this goes. And the more awkward you feel, the more often you're probably doing this correct. So you give them permission. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Be yourself. Because, huh. you know, if you're going to role play, have like a role that you're doing and a character you're driving, they have to be comfortable being themselves. So allowing them to find that internally and just get comfortable with whoever sees it, sees it. I don't care. I'm just going to let myself go. Mm. You got to be, you got to be uncomfortable before you can become comfortable. Do you have to feel almost like a theater teacher sometimes? Oh yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. To talk a little bit more about that, that the parallels between stage work maybe and field work. Yeah. It's just, like I said, it's <clears throat> this, the field is a big stage. That's really what it comes down to. And their ability to project and emote emotion quality, the quality of emotion and the character that they're, they're supposed to be to a, a distance really, really, really far away, further than most stages. A lot of that comes from just presence of the body, um, what they can feel internally and having their own internal storyline to drive that. Um, and just, and again, just making sure, getting them comfortable being uncomfortable because nothing we do in marching band is natural. You know, you don't walk down the street and play something and, and move like an alien, you know, you just, you just have to, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. You, you can't do that without somebody calling for help. I think. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> What's the process of designing the visual side of a marching band show like these days? You know, of course, I remember drill charts and a whole lot of uh, pencils and erasers and, you know, uh, protractors. The process has changed entirely. What's it like right now? What do you do? Yeah, the um, you know, in the in the winter, honestly, in the winter, I I am more of a hands on, just kind of. If I were to throw the marble, let's see where the kids would go. Mm. It's it's more organic. In the fall, it's more of the pieware, and that's where the the pieware being a drill designing software. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's when you get you know. That's when you start to put everything in the computer, you rely on the computer to do it all with you manipulating it and see how it comes out. Does so, it take a long time to write a full 10 minute marching band drill? Uh, it can, depending on the number of students you have to write for, depending on the uh, complexity of the program. So some perform, some groups may be very competitive in nature and want a lot of sheets and a lot of pages. They have a lot of kids. Some are just a football band that just needs to go out there for five minutes and put something that's entertaining out there. So it all depends on the, the level of the kids and the, um, you know, the complexity that they're wanting. How do you visualize drill while listening to music? How do I visualize the drill? Yeah. When, when you're listening to the music and trying to come up with the drill, what's going through your brain? How do you, how do you do it? I see it. I, I just, I just kind of listen to it. And the more I listen to it, the more something comes to me. I, you, you see where the highs and lows of the music comes through. Mm. Um, you see the color. If you really listen to music, you're able to see color through the music. And that was something that um, I was taught early on by, with, with Jason. We would go into the bookstore when you could listen to books or listen to music with the headphones. You know, mm. At Barnes & Noble, you'd be able to listen to a CD. So we would stand there and listen to the music and he'd say, what color do you hear? Oh wow! And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And it's so almost like a, a forced synesthesia. Yeah, yeah. So we'd go to different huh. little CD sets, places, and put their headphones on and listen and 
all right, let's play a game of what colors do you hear? So it's, it's, it's about listening to that process, seeing the journey, just kind of feeling what is the music trying to say to you. Are there certain drill forms that make sense for certain points in the music? For instance, a, a major impact, you know, is that always going to be a unison kind of block that presents itself visually? Or, you know, are there, are there certain, what do you look for in the music that clues you to what kind of drill form you should be writing? Uh, it's... There are and staging. Where, I know staging is a consideration too. Yeah, you got to oh, think about what voices need to be heard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's moments where, you know, say you have a moment where it's musically full and you want to make sure your stage is just as full. So I'm not mm. going to, I'm not going to have the color guard, you know, just really, really close together. I'm going to make sure even if I only have 12 kids, I'm spreading them out as far as possible to try to make up, make as much color, bring as much color to the stage and fill up the stage with that um, with that element to be able to project that forward. Um, you know, sometimes you have some you may have music that sounds very tense in in nature, so you may want to condense people down, make more of a dense block that makes you uncomfortable. Um, so sometimes you can visually be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and it's matching that same musical intention. This is the time of uh, year when. A lot of groups look at what they've got. They've already had commentary from judges. They know they need to make some changes. Uh, it is mid-season change time. Are you being <laughs> deluged with requests for rewrites? Um, yeah, and I think sometimes it comes down to things look great on paper, but when you those dots turn in dots turn into human beings with instruments mm -hmm. and equipment, <laughs> it may not always look like you thought it would, and that's okay. You know, it, it's art and we're working with people, teenage human beings, particularly, <laughs> that you have to make modifications along the way. And um, it's, I wouldn't say major rewrites. I would say some things it's just, sometimes it just doesn't feel right. So let's change the orientation of the guard here, or let's change the orientation of these people here because now as we see them with uniforms on and say the back of their color, back of the uniform is a solid color it may look visually appealing to have those people facing backfield while the color side of the other uniform is coming forward that's musically driving that moment. So you're able to play with some more of those, um, those details later, more mid-season, because you don't see those when you're doing things at the beginning of the design. Well, let's talk about uh, uniforms slash costumes uh, for a moment, because every year I think I notice more and more that the what the performers are wearing plays into the visual design, either by color change, like you were saying, maybe the, the back of the uniforms is solid color, the front is patterned. Uh, maybe they're just two completely different solid colors so that you can, you can play with that. When you're designing the drill, are you also thinking about what they're going to be wearing and, and how that's going to interact? Um, yeah, uh, sometimes. There, um, when it comes to the... The, the drill or the, the uniform itself, I'm, I'm not necessarily pulled to where you have to have a costume or not have a costume. I do like to utilize the colors if there's, you know, that front back um, type of color palette to it. Use that in um, to bring out some of those highlighted moments. I think you definitely see that, have seen that integration of more of a costume look for marching bands. Some of that is, I think, influenced by the indoor activity as well, because you're seeing that more often now changing in the indoor activity. Also the cost of the products, the availability of it, uh, just the evolution of band design over time. You know, it, it may be more cost effective for a group to buy a shell of a costume and change the underlying, um, the underlying shirts, like the, the long sleeves, like Lycra type material to fit what their theme may be. And they can do that easily year after year, uh, as opposed to that heavy wool uniform that right. it is what it is. And there's no altering it, except unless you have parents that are great seamstress uh, to be able to help out. And I think the versatility of those uniforms are, are, are appealing to some groups. The, 
those types of uniforms are also more available than they were 10 to 15, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And I hear the argument sometimes that uh, ensembles risk losing their identity because they look different every season. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I yeah. think sometimes ensembles have an identity based just on how they sound or how they move. And I think if they stay true That's, to that. That is really true in the indoor activity too, because in yeah. a lot of the indoor activity, there has never been a uniform associated with a group, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just sometimes it's just a different, they, they, they have a very unique play on their sound or the way that they move or the overall feel that they tend to give that mm. may just be, that's their look, that's their identity. It may be a group that's just always very emotional in their presentations. They always give you a very emotionally driven show, or it could be somebody that's always giving you a very intellectually driven show. So I think if they stay true to those elements, it doesn't matter really what they're wearing. Let's talk about the skill level of the groups that you write for. Um, how do you... You touched on this a little bit earlier, but how do you, um, you know, how do you let the skill level of a high school band inform your design process? Yeah, at the end of the day, my goal is that I want to make the groups that I design for to have the best quality product and for the kids to feel their very best about what they just did. So I don't want them to be worried about if they're going to be able to achieve what they've been given. Uh, so it's important to write for the, for the level of the students. That's what it comes down to. Uh, for example, a color guard, you can say you, a color guard, you can say a lot more with a solid triple with com maintaining great body composure underneath. than you can say trying to attempt a five or a six on a rifle and they're just up there, you know, praying that it comes back into their hands. Yeah. So that's, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting the best from your performers and by giving them things that they're going to be successful in every time. So it, you know, just remember, it doesn't have to be difficult to be effective. Sometimes less is more. You, you want, you want the kids to feel good about what they did too. And if they're constantly trying to do something that isn't in their wheelhouse yet, that's not going to lend itself to a really good experience for them. Right. And, and, you know, I see it on the field because a, a lot of times I judge um, field visual. So I'm down there with them. And sometimes you just see this look, they're, they're, they're terrified yeah. because they, you can see that they're still uncomfortable with what they're trying to do. And especially at this point of the season, this point of the season should be just taking it to that level of uh, emotion, like emoting the, the, the production rather than trying to figure it out. So I think it's important, again, just writing to the level of your students. You can, you can always make those little modifications, but you want to make sure that you're not writing to your top student. There was a point in my life back in the 80s when I was teaching a couple of high school bands and uh, was on staff at the Glassman where I thought, well, maybe this is, maybe I should not do radio and I should try to do drill design. Um, ultimately, I you know, kept on with radio, but this is a growing field, isn't it? Visual design for the marching arts. If somebody is thinking they might want to make a career out of it, what would you tell them, Kim? Well, first I'd say you need to watch, read, and study. <clears throat> you need to watch groups from many levels, find out what works, what doesn't work, and why. Uh, read books on the concepts and principles of design and just look at art to get a better understanding of that. Um, if you have groups around you, see if you can go to the rehearsals and just watch. You know, watch and just try to get a deeper level of understanding of all that goes into the overall production. Um, second, I would say be a sponge. It, it's something that doesn't happen overnight. And you, you need to try to work first, like you were saying, as a tech. Um, someone once said, you know, we don't have those people that push the play button anymore, where you used to be have somebody just sit up there and push play and just wa having to watch. Oh no, go back, rerun it. Okay, hit the hit the uh, the doctor so beat. Have, yes, the doctor <laughs> beat. Be that person to to try to get a better overall feel of what's happening. Um, learn to teach and listen to those around you. Attend as many clinics as you can, even if it's not in your element, because you're going to get something 
from that to put in your toolbox for later. So for example, if you're a color guard person, go to percussion clinics mm. because you're going to learn a lot and, and how, and in how they do things and how you can incorporate it into your design. Um, so learning all the ins and outs of, of that, at that level first, and then start to build over time. And once you get a gig, read the adjudication manual for your, whatever circuit your group is competing in, whether it be the winter, the summer, the fall, whatever it is, it's important to know what you're being judged on before you write your, your show. Um, making sure that you, you know the rules before you play the game. Um, and finally, I'd say uh, leave your ego at the door. It's important to stay humble and just be okay and know that you're going to make mistakes and that's all right. Um, acknowledge them and learn and grow from those mistakes over time. And that's how you become better as a designer. Um, and just keep, you know, keep in the back of your mind that the show is not about you. It's not about how good you were as a performer or how good you are as a designer. It's about how good you can make your kids look. And it's about taking that knowledge you've just developed over time and making the best product that'll suit those students and for them to be most successful. What about academic fields of study? Um, I, I've seen visual designers and instructors come from you know, fields as diverse as music to architecture, uh, kinesiology. Mm -hmm. what dance, what, what, what field of study do you think, uh, somebody who's young getting out of high school has an eye on visual design for marching bands. What should they study in college? Graphic design's a good one because you learn a lot about the principles of design in that. Um, kinesiology is another amazing one because you're learning how the body actually is able to manipulate through space, you know, just what the body's able to do. Um, and even if you have a major and you're going to be an engineer, take classes in some of those other elements that may help you as you go through. That was fascinating. Thank you, Kim. Kim Kuhn, a visual designer, instructor, and judge living in Michigan. All right, lots to preview this weekend. First of all, we have the first two-day Super Regional stepping off Friday morning at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. As of right now, it looks like there'll be 55 bands or so in prelims, with 14, of course, making it to finals in this uh, Super Regional on Saturday night. Also on Saturday, there will be another three BOA regionals across the country in Johnson City, Tennessee, College Park, Maryland, and one in Orlando, Florida that has attracted bands from as far away as Illinois and Oklahoma. This is the time of year when the performers really start pouring it on, when the shows go from their heads to their hearts, and you don't want to miss a moment. If you can't be with us at one of those shows this weekend, watch online. We are live streaming every show at boalive.tv. And if you really want to take a deep dive into the BOA 2023 tour, check out the BOA tour documentary available to view on the Music for All YouTube channel right now. Part one's already live, part two being released this week. Chuck Henson and I will be your announcers at the Indy Super Regional. I hope I run into you there. In the meantime, go for it. Break ranks. <laughs>